Okay, so this is week three, lecture two. Um, and in this section, we're going to talk about the central and peripheral nervous system. So the neural connections that we just discussed in the last lecture form the physiological base for our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. But how do we get from electrical charges and neurotransmitter release to more complex behaviors? Well, first, our brain decides to act, and then our nervous system propels our body into action. Our nervous system is like a superhighway. It has a two-way flow of traffic. So sensory information comes into, and then decisions come out of, the central nervous system, which is comprised of the brain and spinal cord. And the nerves outside of the central nervous system are called the peripheral nervous system. So here's a breakdown. I'm a visual person. I like diagrams. I think this is really helpful. The central nervous system is comprised of the brain and spinal cord. Um, and then the peripheral nervous system is comprised of the, the somatic and autonomic systems. The autonomic system can be further broken down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. So let's talk first about the central nervous system. It's divided into six distinct sections or systems, which we'll talk about um, on the upcoming slides. The central nervous system is the brain's command center. So what that means is that damage to this area would be highly problematic. So the body has developed some protective mechanisms to keep it safe. One such mechanism is a series of cerebral ventricles. These are pockets in the brain that contain cerebral spinal fluid. They provide the brain with nutrients and cushion against injury. You can think of them as shock absorbers that allow us to move our heads around rapidly without our brains clunking into the side of your skull. So think about when you get an Amazon package when they have all those little air pockets um, in the little plastic that they package your item in so that it doesn't jitter, jiggle around during transit. It's sort of the same idea. So as I mentioned, there are six major sections of the central nervous system that are shown here down the left. I know this might look a little overwhelming. Um, I think that this chart sort of just forms a good overview to help us get organized, but we're going to walk through each of the sections one by one. Let's start with the cerebral cortex. So this is the outermost part of our brain. It's known as the forebrain or the cerebrum. This is the most developed area and is responsible for analyzing sensory information and allowing us to perform complex brain functions like reasoning and language. It generally gives us our more advanced intellectual abilities um, and consists of two cerebral hemispheres, which each serve distinct but integrated functions. Those hemispheres are connected by the uh, corpus callosum. It's sort of like a bridge. What it does is allow for communication between the two hemispheres. The majority of the forebrain is composed of the cerebral cortex, which can be further divided into four lobes. Each lobe has a different function. So there's the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Let's take those one by one. The frontal lobes lie in the most forward part of the cerebral cortex, hence the name, and are responsible for motor function, language, and executive functioning. Um, in fact, they oversee and organize most other brain areas. The frontal lobe is surrounded, uh, sorry, separated from the rest of the cortex by a deep groove called the central sulcus. Next to the central sulcus is the motor cortex, which controls our voluntary muscles and is responsible for body movement. The frontal lobe also contains the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for thinking, planning, and language. Now, one part of the prefrontal cortex is Broca's area. This is a very important part of the brain for speech and language comprehension. The frontal lobes also contribute to things like mood, personality, and self-awareness. And a good example of that is Phineas Gage. He was a railway worker who survived a tamping iron passing through his frontal cortex, as you see in the image on the left. He actually survived um, and formed a really good case study for scientists because obviously we are not able to ethically recreate that sort of injury, but given the specific areas of his brain that were injured, we were able, not we, researchers, scientists, were able to examine how his personality changes and make some, some conclusions or some hypotheses about how damage to those areas impacts um, subsequent personality. 
So I want to show you a video on Broca's area. I think I have to X out of the presenter view for it to work for some reason. But it should play this way. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss Broca's area. Although the anatomical definitions of Broca's area are not completely consistent, it is generally considered to make up some part of a region called the inferior frontal gyrus, which is found in the frontal lobe. In the vast majority of individuals, Broca's area resides in the left cerebral hemisphere. Broca's area was named for the physician Paul Broca, who first identified the region as playing a potentially important role in speech production. Broca based this hypothesis on case studies of patients who had damage to the area and also displayed a deficit of speech. The particular condition Broca observed came to be known as Broca's aphasia and involves a deficit in the ability to produce language. In patients with Broca's aphasia, reading and writing are also often impaired but language comprehension is typically relatively preserved. The precise role of Broca's area in language production, however, is still being debated. In other words, damage to Broca's area can disrupt language production, but nobody is quite sure exactly what language-related function is lost to cause that disruption. Some have hypothesized Broca's area is involved with producing movements, like of the tongue and mouth, that allow speech to be reduced. Others have argued it is involved with syntax, grammar, verbal working memory, or all of the above. Broca's area is also thought to have a variety of other linguistic and non-linguistic functions. It has been recognized as playing an important role in language comprehension, movement, and even understanding the movement or actions of others. Thus, although Broca's area does appear to play a role in language, the overall function seems to be more complex. And we'll talk more about Broca's area when we get to language. Okay, let's go back in. The parietal lobe is located in the upper middle part of the cerebral cortex, just behind the frontal lobe, and it's specialized for touch and perception. It contains the somatosensory cortex, which is sensitive to pain, touch, and temperature. The parietal lobe also helps us to track down, um, track objects' location, shape, orientation in space and helps us represent numbers and process other people's actions as well as communicating visual information to the motor cortex. The temporal lobe is located in the lower part of the cerebral cortex and plays a role in hearing, understanding language, and storing autobiographical memories. It contains the auditory cortex, which is devoted to hearing, and Wernicke's area, which is responsible for speech comprehension. Is it going to work? No. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss Wernicke's area. Although there is some debate over the exact location of Wernicke's area, it is typically considered to reside in the cortex of the left cerebral hemisphere, near the junction between the temporal and parietal lobes. Wernicke's area was named for the German physician Karl Wernicke, who reported that damage to this region results in a deficit, where patients are able to produce speech that resembles fluent language, but actually is meaningless. The disorder came to be known as Wernicke's aphasia, and patients who suffer from it do things like use made-up words or similar-sounding words substituted for one another to produce speech that makes little sense. Patients with Wernicke's aphasia also suffer from a deficiency in their ability to understand language. Wernicke proposed a model for language that involved both the region he discovered and another language center, Broca's area. Broca's area is thought to play a role in speech production, and Wernicke's model, which was later expanded on by neurologist Norman Geschwind and called the Wernicke-Geschwind model, suggested that Wernicke's area creates plans for meaningful speech, while Broca's area is responsible for taking those plans and determining the movements, like of the tongue and mouth, required to turn those plans into vocalizations. It's now thought, however, that this model is too simplistic. Studies indicate that language likely involves widespread networks and cannot be boiled down to a connection between two brain regions. Additionally, evidence now suggests that Wernicke's area may be involved in speech production rather than just comprehension, 
and some have claimed it may not be as important to language comprehension as one's thought. Thus, researchers are still trying to figure out the precise contribution of Wernicke's area to language. And so again, we'll talk more about Wernicke's area when we get to the section on language. Lastly, the occipital lobe lies at the back and base of the brain. It contains the primary visual cortex. When sensory information enters the brain, it goes first to the primary sensory cortex, which initially processes the information. Then it gets passed along to the association cortex, which integrates these simpler functions to perform more complex ones. We'll talk more about this next week when we talk about sensation and perception. The association cortex plays a key role in perception, memory, attention, and conscious awareness. Processing becomes increasingly complex as information is passed along in this network. We now move to the second feature of the central nervous system, the basal ganglia. These are structures that are buried deep within the forebrain to help control movement. Damage to this area contributes to illnesses that are associated with lack of control over movement, such as Parkinson's or Tourette's. The basal ganglia is the next step in the chain after sensory information passes through the primary and association areas. It also helps us to engage in movements aimed at obtaining reward and reinforcement. So my best friend and I love going to the melting pot for fondue. It's probably my favorite restaurant. So whenever we plan to eat there, she jokes all day that she has anticipation hunger. This anticipation of a pleasurable outcome is based in the basal ganglia. The third feature of the central nervous system is the limbic system. It's a set of highly interconnected brain regions. Um, this is also known as the emotional center of the brain and plays a role in smell, motivation, and memory. The limbic system also processes information about our internal states, such as blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, etc. And it houses the thalamus, hypothalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus. So let's take another look at those. We're going to breeze through this pretty quickly. As I said, I just want you to have an overview of the different parts. We don't need to go too crazy. Although there's some debate about what structures are part of the limbic system, there's four that are pretty commonly accepted. So first is the thalamus. This contains many areas, um, each of which connects to a specific region of the cerebral cortex. Its main function is to serve as sort of a switchboard which relays information from the sense organs to primary sensory cortex. The hypothalamus, which is located below the thalamus, regulates and controls internal body states and controls the pituitary gland. The running joke in psychology is that the hypothalamus is responsible for the four Fs, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and sexual activity. The amygdala is small and almond-shaped and plays a key role in fear, excitement, and arousal. So if I showed you pictures of people's faces while they watched a scary movie, you'd probably be able to identify that they were feeling fear. But in one case study of a 30-year-old woman who had amygdala damage, researchers noticed a marked impairment in detecting fear on people's faces. She also showed no fear when shown a scary movie or when she was asked to hold a snake. Finally, the hippocampus plays a role in spatial memory. Damage to this area causes inability to form new memories, but old ones are left intact. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the limbic system. The word limbic comes from the Latin limbus, which means border, and the limbic system was given this name because its structures lie along a horseshoe-shaped area of cortex that appears to be a border between the cerebral cortex and the subcortical structures of the diencephalon. There are many processes associated with the limbic system, but the system is most frequently linked to emotion. There is no consensus on the structures that are considered a part of the limbic system, and some argue that it is too much of a simplification to consider something as complex as emotion to be handled by one group of brain structures. Regardless, these are some structures that are often included in the limbic system. The amygdala is an almond-shaped collection of nuclei found in the temporal lobe that seems to be especially involved with fearful and anxious emotions. The hippocampus is next to and interconnected with the amygdala, 
Although it is considered part of the limbic system, the hippocampus is generally associated with memory more so than emotion. The parahippocampal gyrus is an area of cortex that surrounds the hippocampus and also plays a role in memory. The cingulate cortex or cingulate gyrus is found just above the corpus callosum and is involved in various aspects of emotion and memory. The septal nuclei have connections with a number of other limbic structures and are thought to be especially important to pleasure, reward, and reinforcement. The mammillary bodies are two groups of nuclei that are involved in memory and have extensive connections with the amygdala and hippocampus. The fornix is a fiber bundle that carries information from the hippocampus to the mammillary bodies and then onto the thalamus. The hypothalamus controls hormone release via the anterior pituitary and can exert widespread influence over bodily states to maintain homeostasis. While there are other structures that may be included in the limbic system, the structures identified here are some that are commonly considered part of it. Next up is the cerebellum. This is Latin for little brain because it functions as a miniature version of the cortex. The cerebellum is primarily responsible for our sense of balance. So not surprisingly, damage to this area is associated with feeling a little off. Scientists have also identified the cerebellum as important in contributing to executive memory, um, spatial and linguistic abilities. The brain stem is located all the way at the back of the brain. It contains the midbrain, pons, and medulla. It also connects the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord and governs the basic bodily functions that, you know, keep us alive. And also serves as sort of a relay station between the cortex and the rest of the nervous system. There are four main parts of the brainstem. So first there's the midbrain. This contributes to movement, tracking of visual stimuli, and reflexes that are triggered by sound. The reticular activating system connects the forebrain, excuse me, and cerebral cortex, and plays a key role in arousal. It's also thought to be related to problems with ADHD. The pons connects the cortex to the cerebellum um, and is related in, to triggering dreams. So if any of you have really bizarre dreams or very vivid dreams, you can thank your pons. The medulla regulates breathing, um, heartbeat, and other vital functions. It also controls nausea and vomiting. So that explains why vomiting often occurs when there's concussions to the back of the head. Um, the medulla is really important. Serious damage to it can actually result in brain death. I don't know why these videos aren't working today. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the brain stem. The brain stem is a stalk that leaves the base of the brain and connects the brain to the spinal cord. It contains many important pathways that run between the brain and spinal cord, as well as pathways to other areas like the cerebellum. It also contains a large number of important nuclei and is essential for both survival and proper cognitive functioning. It consists of three major divisions, the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. The medulla oblongata, often simply called the medulla, is the point where the brainstem connects to the spinal cord. The medulla is essential for survival as it contains nuclei that ensure vital systems like the cardiovascular and respiratory systems are working properly. The medulla also contains nuclei that are responsible for a number of reflexive actions, including vomiting, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing. Several cranial nerves also exit the brainstem at the level of the medulla. The next structure on our way up the brainstem is the pons. The word pons means bridge in Latin, and the pons is a large, rounded structure resembling a rounded bridge that connects the medulla and the midbrain. The pons is home to a number of nuclei for cranial nerves and contains nuclei that deal with sensations from the head and face, motor movement of the eyes, face, and mouth, hearing, equilibrium, and autonomic functions like tear and saliva production. The final branch of the brainstem as we move toward the cerebrum is called the midbrain. On the posterior side of the midbrain, we find four bumps representing two paired structures, the superior and inferior colliculi. The superior colliculi are involved in eye movements and visual processing, while the inferior colliculi are involved in auditory processing. The midbrain also contains a major dopamine producing nuclei of the brain, the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra. Among other functions, the ventral tegmental area is involved in motivation and reward while the substantia nigra plays an important role in movement.
The last part of the central nervous system is the spinal cord. This is a thick bundle of nerves that extends from our brainstem, runs down the middle of our backs, conveying information between the brain and the rest of the body. Nerves extend from neurons to the body, traveling in two directions, much like the traffic on two, a two-lane highway. Sensory information is carried from the body to the brain by way of sensory nerves, and then commands are carried out from the brain to the body by way of motor nerves. The spinal cord also contains sensory neurons that are called interneurons. Um, these send messages to other neurons that are located nearby. Interneurons connect sensory nerves with motor reflex, uh, sorry, motor nerves within the spinal cord without having to report back to the brain. Interneurons explain how reflexes, automatic motor responses to sensory stimuli can occur. Okay, so this is just fun. Um, it's the brain stem song. This is a song about parts of the brain. I'm singing it to memorize the name. The ideas here may be simplistic, but matching meaning and rhyme is a tough logistic. Cerebral cortex has four main lobes with names from the nearby skull bones. Frontal does the thinking, occipital deals with vision, parietal senses, objects, and temporal lessons. Inside these lobes, there's specialties, like Broca's area, which produces speech. Wernicke's area handles language comprehension. And the motor cortex is for moving with intention. Sensory cortex handles perception of touch, pain, temperature, and proprioception. There's two outer brain parts that are distinct. They seem separate, but everything is linked. The cerebellum does balance and coordination. And it has our memorized movement archive. The brainstem sets heartbeat and respiration and other things we need to survive. The brain's inner parts are unique. We cut the corpus callosum to take a peek. The thalamus signal routing and the amygdala's emotions can have shouting the hippocampus does our long-term memory saving and the hypothalamus makes our sex and food cravings the anterior sing cingulate cortex the anterior cingulate cortex learns from mistakes. And in controlling movement, the basal ganglia is the brakes. The brain parts list is much longer indeed. But for my class assignment, this is all I need. All right, that's a little silly, but I think it's kind of fun. So, hey, good study guide. Okay, so we just spent all this time talking about the central nervous system, and now we're going to literally blow through the peripheral nervous system in one slide. The peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves that extend outside of the ner central nervous system. That's why they're called peripheral. It contains two branches, the somatic and autonomic. The somatic nervous system conveys information between the central nervous system and the body, controlling and coordinating voluntary movement. The autonomic nervous system controls the involuntary actions of the internal organs and glands. The autonomic system can be further divided up into the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. So the sympathetic division is activated during emotional arousal. It mobilizes that flight or fight response, while the parasympathetic division controls rest and digestion. So I have one more video for you. 
Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the divisions of the nervous system. There are two major divisions of the nervous system. The first is the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. The second is the peripheral nervous system, which consists of nerves that run throughout the body. The peripheral nervous system itself is made up of two subdivisions. The first is the somatic nervous system, which contains nerves that carry sensory signals from the body to the central nervous system, and nerves that carry motor signals from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscles. The somatic nervous system is associated with voluntary movement. When you clicked on this video to play it, the signal to depress your finger was sent from your brain to your finger via the somatic nervous system. The second division of the peripheral nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is sometimes called the involuntary nervous system, and it is involved in regulating the internal environment of the body. It carries signals from internal organs to the central nervous system and from the central nervous system to the internal organs. In this way, it is involved in regulating things like digestion and heartbeat, which are generally outside the realm of conscious control. The autonomic nervous system can be further subdivided into sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers. The sympathetic nervous system plays a large role in stimulating and mobilizing energy resources, while the parasympathetic nervous system acts to conserve energy. For example, if you're in a frightening situation, the sympathetic nervous system will cause your heart rate to increase, your blood pressure to increase, and your sweat glands to be stimulated. If you're eating a meal, however, and are not frightened, your parasympathetic nervous system will stimulate digestion, increase salivation, and slow your heart rate. Due to these functions, the sympathetic nervous system is often described as being involved in fight or flight responses while the parasympathetic nervous system is described as being involved in rest and digest responses. Okay, so that wraps up our discussion of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. I know that was a little bit of a crash course. We sort of hurricaned our way through that. And if you have any specific questions, I would be more than happy to chat with you. So up next, we're going to talk about the endocrine system, and I will talk to you then.